Hey, welcome to Ike's Vintage Tech. Back in 1995, if you needed a powerful workstation computer and you had a powerful budget to match, you could get this pizza box computer that could pretty much do anything you needed it to back then. This particular pizza box is running NextStep OS 3.3 for the PA Risk processor. This is an HP 712-100 workstation, and this thing is just amazing for its time. Let's dig in. Thanks for watching. If you like delicious vintage tech content like this, please consider subscribing. I also have a Patreon on the link below. It'll help put some toppings on this thing. All right, now that I got that all out of the way, let's get this thing out of the box. And big shout out to Jets Pizza for the box. Now that I got it out of the box, let's take a closer look. Back in 1995, this thing was $15,000 bucks. Now, in today's money, that's over $32,600. If you decided to spend $5,000 on the Next Step OS developer kit, that was another $5,000. We're talking $42,000 in today's money. Now, what would you expect to get with this? Well, clearly, you can play chess, pool, and have a bouncy ball, but it would also do quite a bit more. A lot of what we do on today's computers, you can link back to Next Step OS. The first web browser was developed for Next Step OS. Doom and Quake were also built on Next Step OS. When Apple bought Next back in December of 96, not only did they bring Steve Jobs back into the company, they also brought the Next Step OS with them. It eventually became the basis for what we know as Mac OS X. Much of the user interface that you see here is very similar to early versions of Mac OS X, and obviously some things up to this day. Now that I got the little history lesson out of the way, Let's shut it down and take a look inside and just see exactly what we're dealing with here. To open this up, I first had to get rid of my coffee. I don't need to be spilling anything into this. You do want to slide it forward just a bit. There are two clips on the back. One of mine broke, unfortunately. And it carefully lifts right up. It is very hard to get open when it's been shut for 30 years. First time I had to open it, it was a rough, rough open. Looking at the inside here, we have 192 mega RAM, which is quite a bit for 1995. We have a purple heat sink here. This is our CPU. It's a little warm. I'm probably going to want to put some thermal paste on that. This is our video RAM right here. I don't know how much is on there off the top of my head. This is a SCSI hard drive, 50 pin, our floppy drive, and our power supply. It's not much in here. This is nice little styrofoam case cover for anti-vibration and that's the whole computer there are a couple ports here for expansion i don't have anything to expand right now and i'm going to flip this around so you can see the back here's the back side we have our two expansion ports audio rs232 vga ps2 mouse and keyboard our parallel port our scuzzy port and our lan you also have the AUI LAN, which is an older standard. I don't have anything that runs on that, unfortunately, but I do have this. I have not been able to configure the network on this, but I also haven't tried very hard yet. And this is pretty good for what it was back then. Luckily, the battery is also not one of the ones that explode. It's just a coin cell, so I don't have to worry about that much. Now, you probably notice that there's no CD-ROM on this thing, and all the software that you have to install comes on CD, which was one of the biggest problems I had getting this to work. Now, there is an external SCSI port. I don't have any external SCSI CD-ROMs that use that port. I would have had to buy a cable. What I do have is an old SCSI CD-ROM and a SCSI cable and a power splitter, and that's how I eventually got it to work. Now, it doesn't just work with any SCSI CD-ROM. You have to have the right settings as far as the SCSI address for the CD-ROM has to be SCSI address 2. The hard drive has to be a higher SCSI address instead of just zero, which is weird. Uh, that's some of the problems I came across. There's a website, a link below, uh, Pizza Box blog, uh, that was very helpful in getting this done. And it was very difficult because of one thing, these CD-ROMs are very old and a lot of them don't work anymore. This was the one that ended up working for me. It's an actual HP brand CD-ROM, and that did the trick. I had so many errors, trial and errors, 
getting a working SCSI drive in here, I eventually pulled one out of a Macintosh 8100 and that did the trick. And it, I had a nine gig SCSI that I thought was gonna work in here, it did not. As far as the capabilities, it could have been the fact that the drive was dead. I don't really have an easy way to test those old SCSI hard drives and I could always plug them into my other Macs, but that's a whole other thing I haven't even dug into yet. So that's why I, I just, I found a drive that worked. I found a drive here that worked and it took a lot of trial and error, but I did get it working. The next problem I had getting this to work was the mouse. If you have a regular PS2 mouse and it has a scroll wheel, it won't work, at least the ones I have. I tried many different mice. I eventually dug deep into my bins and I found this particular Microsoft mouse that does not have a scroll wheel. Now the mice that came with this originally would have been a two button or three button mouse. So any of those probably do work just fine. But if you have a scroll wheel on yours, not gonna work. Luckily it wasn't as picky with the keyboard. Now the monitor was also a problem. This monitor would not get the right refresh rate and resolution at first. It runs at something like 1280 by 1024. Once I got it working on a regular widescreen monitor, it kind of looked funny. Sometimes it would boot up green instead of a regular color palette and you just had to reboot and it would work fine. And once I got it booted on that monitor, I figured out the right resolution to set it as and it then worked. It took me a while to figure out all the kinks. And like I said, I'm gonna link that uh, blog down below. It was very helpful. But let's get this back together and show you the boot up process. Now you do have to be careful. The floppy drive cover is made from graham crackers and it can easily pop off and break. I'm also not gonna push this thing all the way shut because it is very hard to get back out once you do get that clip clipped in. To power it on, let's just go ahead and push the front button there. Fan spins up, that's always a good sign. And in a second here, we should see the boot screen. There we go, you're gonna see the red Hewlett Packard logo. I'm gonna hit escape real quick here, that gets us into the actual boot menu here. I'm gonna zoom in on this so you can take a better look at that. As you can see here at the boot admin menu, you have quite a few different options you can do. Uh, if you want to pause it, go ahead and read all of them through there. I'm going to show you the important ones that I needed to use to get this up and running. You can do a search command and then SCSI, and that will give you all your SCSI bus. And in this moment, I only have one device connected. And there it is right there, SCSI 0.0, .0 Quantum Fireball. And that is the hard drive that is in there. You can also do SCSI LAN. That'll tell you if you have any network connectivity. Uh, it's not really gonna work unless you have an old network set up. You can also do information, which tells you about the computer, the fact that it's got 192 mega RAM, the board serial number, boot ROM, all that stuff right there. And the other thing you wanna be able to do, and this is especially important, is monitor. And depending on the resolution that you need to set for your monitor, this is where you would do it. And once you set this, you're good to go until you unplug it, unless you have a working CMOS battery. But you would basically do monitor and then whatever number you need. So monitor eight in my case is what worked. Here we are back at the boot admin menu. Now, one thing I did have an issue with where I could not get this thing to boot up, it would constantly fail at trying to connect the network. And the issue I had was that the CD-ROM was still plugged in. Basically, after I did the full install and the first boot, I had to unplug the CD-ROM, make sure that the hard drive was the only thing on there. And then you can do a boot SCSI.0.0 and that will boot right up to your hard drive. Now, it'll also auto boot if you just let it, but when you're in that boot admin menu, the only way to boot into the system is to type that in. And this should be pretty quick.
And that's your boot up. It goes pretty quick. I did have to cut it only because it hung for a while waiting to try to find a network that was not connected. Now that you saw the whole boot process, the basic operating system itself, I do want to do some more things with this. I want to download some games on here. I do need to get the network working just because I don't want to have to connect a CD-ROM every time I need to get something on here. I would prefer to get it over the network. So that's going to be a whole thing I got to figure out for myself. I do want to also put Debian on here. This thing will run Debian. They do have a modern version for the PA Risk processor. So of course, I'm going to put that on here. I also want to find out how the original HP UX operating system worked. I never personally used it myself, and that is something else that would run on here. And you know, why not? I do want to check this out. I, see, I want to see how much I can get done with this thing. It is a very nice computer, even for today's standards on how snappy it is and the graphics it has. It's obviously not going to be playing the latest and greatest of anything, but it is a very important computer in computing history only for the fact that it was something that was not Intel back in the 90s. It wasn't a Mac. It wasn't Intel. It was a very niche market that just didn't survive, unfortunately. This is like a great grandfather to the M series chips that Apple uses today, where RISC and ARM are very similar, where ARM is a licensed processor and RISC is an open source processor. So it is very similar sidestep to what we currently are using in Apple devices today. And that's something that is pretty cool when you think about it, just the fact that this thing is running on the base architecture that is very similar to what we're using today on a very limited level, of course. But the fact that this thing is not running an x86 platform, it's not running a Motorola platform, it is just a pretty cool little box that I'm very happy to be using and I do plan on doing more with it. If you guys want to see anything on here in particular, Doom, Quake, obviously I want to try to get those on here and download it and just see how they run, let me know. Uh, leave comments down below. Let me know anything else you'd want to see on this thing, and I'll see what I can do. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it, and stay tuned for more. On a side note, this is going to be one of my last videos in this room. I am almost completely ready to move into the garage and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to do that by next weekend. Thank you very much. I might have another video in here. I might not. And uh, we'll see where, I, where the next one is, hopefully without an echo. Stay tuned.